Hello everyone, time's up, so it's time to start. So, it's so nice to see all of you. It's to be, to be there uh, for the second time. Um, this time, we don't have that much time, and we'll be talking about functional exception handling ideas for Java. Since we are kind of limited in time, uh, you can consider this more like an overview, uh, pitch kind of discussion. Uh, my name is Grzegorz. Um, if you think about my name and if you drop the Z's, it becomes pronounceable. Uh, I come from Poland. I work remotely for a company based on Malta. Um, I do trainings around Europe and I do some open source. So the topic I've chosen for today is exceptions. A new approach to exceptions that have been all there for quite a long time in the functional world. But since Java is adopting more and more functional ideas, I thought it would be a really good idea to try to bring those ideas to Java and show and raise awareness how those things can look like. So the criticism for, well, the way we deal with exceptions in imperative style of programming, it's been around for quite a while. For example, this quote is from a blog post by Joel Spolsky from Stack Overflow from 2003. And people started noticing that there is something not right about how we deal with exceptions. All those abrupt jumps, they become very unpredictable. And there was not really a place for that in functional programming, where we kind of try to limit uh, all possible movements. We try to restrict ourselves to be able to um, write safer code that that has a higher chance of actually working. So there was no place for that, mostly because um, if, you, if you work with exceptions, you create also unexpected exit points. If you think about functional programming and how you compose functions together, um, the big emphasis is put on making them pure and predictable, which pretty much means that if you put some value into a function, you kind of can be pretty much, you can be sure that what you expect, what you get from the other side of the function, well, it's always the same. Plus, it doesn't cause any unpredictable side effects. So if you imagine a function as a pipe, and if you look at the output of it all the time, in assuming it's a pure function, you will never be surprised. That's not the case if you think, if you look at the, the way we deal with exceptions. Because suddenly it turns out that this, this pipe you look at can leak in many different spots. Uh, and this is not cool, because we might end up in uh, states that we never thought of. So this is why sometimes um, sarcastically name say that, go, that exception handling in Java, or the, the way it's, done, the, the way it's done, done in other languages, is like enterprise uh, great go-to statement. Um, the other problem is that the code paths that create that get created by applying except standard exception handling are not very clear. They are not very visible um, in code itself. So if you go over a review on, on GitHub, this is likely something you won't be able to see there. Plus, if you throw multi-threading into the picture, it becomes even harder because sometimes um, exceptions can be thrown in some threads; those can disappear and we have a problem. What's also very interesting is that exceptions are not that cheap as we might think. If you think about a structure of a typical exception of the, of the object, what could it be? It could be a POJA or something, right? You, you have a message there, uh, some string, maybe reference to cause, what else? But it turns out that instantiation of exceptions is much more expensive than instantiation of a typical POJA. And the reason for that is that there is one very interesting method called fill in stack trace. And this one is very expensive because you need to run over the whole stack, collect frames, and construct the stack trace. If you really want to see like, a lot of details about what's going on in there, there, are, there is a very good write up about that by Heinz Kabutz. But there is also one very interesting benchmark done by Norman from Netty. So since Netty is a high performance solution, they started experimenting in many different ways, how they can push the performance further. And one of the things they looked at were exceptions. So what happened here is that Norman and, their, and the team started playing around with exceptions. So 
if instantiation of an exception is very costly because of the need of constructing a, a stack trace, well, they thought they could do something with that. There are situations in the code where you don't really need um, all this information that's in the stack trace, um, or maybe it's just the same. So maybe we could cache that or get rid of that completely. And this is what they were playing with. So on, uh, on the one side, you have a classical exception handling. So you have an operation run in a loop, and the new exception object is being created on every iteration. But on the other side, you have extreme situation with a stackless um, static exception just being thrown always in the same scenario. And as you can see on this graph, you can see that this is operations per millisecond. Um, so the higher the bar, the better the result. So on the left side, you, you see the result for classical exception instantiation, which as you can see, the result is less than uh, um, less than one operation per millisecond, while on the right side, with the stackless exception, it's over 60. So as you can see, the difference is really huge. Um, and now, there are different ways of approaching exceptions. And one of the interesting ideas is something that was brought um, to our world by Go. So Go doesn't treat exceptions, well, exceptionally. Go treats all those values as simple, well, those are just values, right? At the end of the day, if you call some method um, and it results, for example, in the user not present exception, well, there's nothing exceptional in that. User is not there. It's a value. And if you represent your errors as values, it turns out that things get much simpler. So, but Go. In Go, you can return more than one value from a function. So if you have a method called foo that accepts a string, can return string and an error, for example. And what do you need to do to handle that? Well, since this is a value, you check if this value was present. So you do a simple null check, and that's all. And I will give you a few seconds to recover from the disappointment, because you went here probably to learn about functional programming ideas, and I'm showing you just null checks. But if you look at this from um, another point of view, let's ap appreciate how simple things become. There are no try catches, no uh, exceptions traveling in paths that you've never expect them. It's a simple value that can be processed as anything else. So you can do a null check, go inside, process it, abandon, or totally ignore it. Your choice. But things become much simpler. But one more thing is that Go introduced a separation of uh, concerns. Because we can, on one side, we can have errors. On the other hand, we can have something exceptions that are reserved for unrecoverable errors. So whenever something bad happens, like, like real bad, like you can't recover from that, there's a special word for that. And it's called panic. So it reflects the intention pretty well, I think. But meanwhile, in Java, what's happening? Um, we, over time, managed to identify quite a, quite a lot anti-patterns related to exception handling. Well, naturally, those are, are all contextual, so, but still, there's quite a lot of them. And many of those probably would not exist if we were dealing with values instead of those special entities that can, um, that can travel we on weird uh, paths. So, once we know this, let's rebrush a bit our knowledge about static typing and type-driven development. Luckily, we are on a JVM conference, so I don't need to convince a lot of people um, to try playing with static typing, but it's still a good idea to recall a few things. Especially recently, um, I remember that uh, Uncle Bob, like well, over a year ago, wrote a blog post about Kotlin and Swift. And he bashed those languages for being too statically typed, that this is very inconvenient in many cases. Uh, because in the ideal world, the programmer will be given a full power of using dynamic typing. And all constraints, all contracts would be enforced by writing tests. So you would write tests that would give you the same kind of a safety um, that um, static typing gives you. But 
as you as you probably know, you've been you worked in many different projects. Um, on the one hand, we have problems with discipline. So, on the other hand, if your tests run very well a long time, then you are not likely to run them a lot. So, as you can see. Um, you can save a lot of time by using static typing properly. I see that Mario is there. Hi, Mario. Mario goes only to functional uh, talks, even if he's seen them already a few times. So, um, what we can learn from that is that by leveraging static typing properly, uh, we can get a much faster feedback about things that we do. Well. If we write our test cases, we need to run them. Um, but if we shape our domain properly, um, that's the compiler that can tell us pretty much, instant, uh, pretty much on the spot. So there's a lot we can uh, save on that. Keep in mind that this is the main idea of the Agile, to shorten the feedback loop. The shorter the feedback loop, the quicker we can adapt and change things. And a bit of specific question. Um, have, you ever, have you ever seen how um, uh, CGI specialists deal with uh, animation and uh, objects modeling? Well, a long time ago, I used to think, well, quite naively, that, for example, they might work, you know, pixel by pixel every frame and, and, and so on. That would be a lot of work, right? But what turns out what they do is that instead of just working, you know, on a very low level construct, they use they, they do something called rigging, which pretty much means they create certain object and script it and define where, let's say, a leg of a robot can move, which um, when and what can it fire, um, or how it behaves when you or how let's say different um, like how how hands move where where it walks and so on. So they also kind of shape their domain. And once this is done, they give it out to animators where they can actually play around. And their job is pretty much to just move controls around and not play with, well, with raw pixels or, or with assembly, as we would do, or maybe with, well, binary directly. And this is what we forget a lot, because when I, when I, when I go to different projects, I see them, um, it turns out that our domains are more and more stringly typed and not strongly typed. Um, but that's kind of understandable, because, well, if you go for JavaScript or a dynamically typed language, well, you don't need to write types, and you benefit from that instantly. Well, you don't need to put additional effort to benefit from dynamic typing. Types are not there, and, well, you benefit from that. With static typing, it's kind of harder, because you need to invest into building your domain properly, into shaping it, so that it helps you in the long term. So, well, obviously you can use strings and low-level constructs, data, data, structures for everything. Um, but this won't save you in many cases, because, well, not every name is a surname. Not every phone, well, phone number is not the same as age, although both can be numbers, right? So what can we do? What can we do is actually work on our domains, shape them, add some additional semantic meaning, um, and uh, benefit from that. And actually, in the Java world, we started noticing that this can be applied in many different contexts. So, for example, in Java 8, four years ago, we got optionals. So, we rediscovered that optionality doesn't need to be expressed with a low-level construct like a, well, let's say, null pointer, but can be expressed with a custom type that encapsulates optionality. And by now, you should be all pretty much familiar with that. The session is short. We don't have much time to go into that. But if you already know optional, well, that you, that you can use types well, to encapsulate certain context and, um, and give out to consumers a certain, let's say in this case, null safe API, why not apply the same principle, well, for example, to exception handling? And this is one of the first ideas um, that I'm about to show you for exception handling here. So, what Scala, for example, brings us is a concept called try. This is essentially an optional, just for exceptions. The API will be very similar. This is, this is how you interact with that. But instead of encapsulating optionality, we'll encapsulate um, exception handling. 
Um, so for example, if you have a method like get search results, it returns a list of URLs, but it can throw an IO exception. So what you could do, immediately do, is to kind of get rid of that throws IO exception part and encapsulate the result in a try object. This is, this is really cool because um, now it's very clear from the uh, consumer's perspective that something can go wrong. You are forced to process that, but it's not that in, as inconvenient as working with checked exceptions. Um, and you can do this obviously for runtime exceptions, not only for checked exceptions. So if you start interacting with that tool, well, as you can see, it looks kind of similar to how you would interact with optional. You have methods like map, filter, um, but this is, this, is, this is how monadic tools work. Um, but since in this case we are dealing with exceptions, those kind of tools can be enriched with many different additional methods. So for example, besides methods like map or filter, you can find methods like on a failure or recover with or any other except, uh, exception related uh, APIs, which is really cool. Those examples are all from Waver. Waver is, is inspired a lot uh, by how things were done in Scala. So if you want to start playing with those tool, uh, with those things, Waver is a great choice. You don't need to move over to Scala. You just add one more jar and all tools are right there. It does a really great job when it comes to bringing functional ideas straight to Java. So if you go over the API, you will find very familiar methods like map, flat map, filter, or, 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 or else to dealing with, well, negative scenarios or specifying default values, plus methods like on failure, on success, recover. Um, what's really cool is that the, those concepts you can, can be found in many different languages, many different libraries. The APIs might vary a bit, but at the end of the day, the concept is the same. So you can do the homework, read the docs, and you should be fine. What's really cool is that this kind of also very nicely composes from the producer side. So at the example that we've seen in a second, we were working with a, from the consumer side. We were consuming a try object, um, but now let's see how does it look like when we produce a try, when we expose something to a, uh, to a consumer. So let's try to implement the method that I've shown in a second ago. This one will be based on two things, on get from Google and get from DuckDuckGo. Both throw a lot of exceptions. And on the first look, it might look kind of scary, but the whole thing is mostly above uh, mostly about putting the, the call that might throw an exception into a try object and then working with the API itself. And what's quite interesting is that in optional, what you would put into, a, um, into an optional, well, it's a normal object. It can exist or not. But since try is dealing with exception handling, what you put inside is, is a method call well, or a lambda expression. So we put the method call inside a try object, then we can specify declaratively using methods like recover. So for example, recover from no such element exception, recover with an empty list, because we don't need to abuse consumer by forcing that person to, to handle the exception. Well, no such element exception is pretty much equal to empty list, right? And then if something went wrong, well, we can still use or else and fall back to another implementation. And now, what's really, um, what's really interesting is that another idea of dealing with exceptions is actually leveraging option. But I've just, you might be asking ourselves that I've just told you that option is for dealing with optionality. Yes, that's true, but it's still very rela rela related. Because often you can find methods like find any value of, and they might throw exceptions like no such element exception or number format exception. And those often don't carry any additional information other than the information that the, absent, the, the, the value is absent. So let's rewrite that to try, because, well, we just learned it. OK, looks better. So now we are not, throw, not forcing consumers to deal with exceptions, just forcing them to deal with, with a try. But tries work really fun, really good if you actually have some additional pro exception processing to be done in there. But here, well, it's just an absence. 
So there is not that much to process, no exception to handle, no additional value to extract from an exception object. In those cases, in many ways, um, the actual way out would be to just ditch the exception handling at all. Well, if absence can be modeled simply using our types and using optionality, why bother using exceptions? You just force your consumer to deal with an exception. If your consumer wants to throw an exception in an exceptional situation like this one, that person can still do this on an optional object, which is pretty cool. Um, another idea is, let's say that we want to go beyond that. Let's say that we really like the approach that Go took, um, the one with returning two results. Well, we can do that. Uh, we can do that, for example, by using something called tuple. We can put two things in there. We can put, uh, and let's say, our, our value that we return and an error object. But now it becomes very inconvenient to actually handle that because you need to handle um, both cases, you need to check to do two null checks, and it's not really cool because, well, we deal even with even more null checks than, than before. That's because tuples are not really designed for working with uh, optional objects. So there is an actual solution to that. Um, the idiomatic solution, I mean, from functional languages, it's called an either. This is a tool that can, uh, either object can hold an ob uh, object of two different types inside, but only one at a time. And it becomes super handy when it comes to dealing with exceptions. Because now you can have kind of Go, similar to Go semantics, um, you can return two objects, well, not two objects at once, only one, but of two different types. Plus, you get a very uh, handy API for dealing with those kind of situations. So now, if you think about this for a second, either can hold one of two types. So it's pretty much, if you put a throwable on one side of either, this becomes effectively a try. Um, but as you can see here, you are, those are two arbitrary types. So you are not limited to throwables. It means you can shape your own uh, error objects. You don't need to create exceptions. You can create your custom-made ob custom objects and then simply return them. And here, this is a very general purpose tool. So it's, um, there's nothing exception related in there. It just can be used this way. So if you want to instantiate such an object, well, there are just factory methods, left or right. You're presenting one of the sides of there. But here comes a very interesting concept. You know, if you look at an option from Java, it's biased towards, well, um, existence of an object. So if you call a map or filter, um, it will only do something when an object is present. Same with a try. If you call a map or a filter on a successful try, something will happen. If you do the same on a failure try, nothing will happen. But in either, you don't have this distinction. The general idea is that both sides are equal. But then the question, how, how do you work with that? You have a special tools for that, called projections. So from every either, usually you can derive either a left projection or a right projection. So a left projection will behave like a um, left biased either, and right projection will behave like a right biased either. What's quite interesting is that since some time, uh, especially in Scala, and this will be the case in Waver, uh, either's are biased by default. So it's good to remember about that. So, if you don't actually go for a projection, you get all those ugly methods like buy map fault, get or else get. Well, you can work with that, but it's not very handy. But let's have a look how this could look like if we actually le leverage, uh, leverage projections. But in order to be able to do that, we need to first come up with our own error object. Well, in Scala, that will be just a one line. But we are in Java. We need to write a bit more. Yes, I used to laugh from this a lot, but um, if you've been following what's happening in the Java world lately, um, we, are, we are likely to get uh, record classes that will work essentially like this one. Not in Java 12, though, I think. So let's have a look at our initial example and rewrite it using either. So, so far we had the get search results that would return a try of list of URLs. This try could have either list of URLs or an exception that got thrown along the way. But now we get 
we go for the option with our custom error object. So now it's the same method, it returns an either, and it returns either a fetch error or a list of URLs. As simple as that. And now, if you actually want to process those exceptions, well, you call the method, you get an either object, and now, if you want to process the actual result of the positive case scenario, you create the right projection, and then finally you can use the, the known API. Same for optional, same for try, filter maps, and so on. But when you want to process, check if there was an, the, well, the error happened, you go for the left projection, and then you work on the left side of the equation here. What's really cool is that actually you can use either not only for exception handling, it's also usable whenever you have a, a logic that actually diverges into two ways. You can think about DNS URL resolution. Well, you can either get, an, you can either get um, well, it resolved or pointed out to another DNS server. What's really cool is that uh, you can see this used in practice, for example, in Scala language itself. This is how Taylor recursion is done in Scala. Well, it's an either. It's a kind of com complicated example, but, well, it's used there. But since we are getting slowly to the end, we have only three minutes left, uh, I would like to remind you that the using common sense is the ultimate best practice. Um, I've done this talk once in France and got feedback that someone, someone really liked it, got those ideas, and now they are rewriting all exception handling to either's. So this is definitely not the way to go, because sometimes we might end up with some uh, really creepy things. So try to learn the tool, try to understand that, and apply where it makes sense. Try is great. You can apply it to pretty much um, after you leave this talk. With either, it's kind of harder because, um, well, we don't, we don't work in isolation. We work with libraries that throw exceptions um, or work with code bases that's been out there you know, for 5, 10, 20, 30 years or something. Um, so sometimes once you bring new ideas to the table, um, you might lose because there is no alignment. You can have different practices clashing together. And Sometimes you would need to, for example, try catch all exceptions generated by other libraries and rewrite them to either's, which can be fishy. So definitely use a common sense. And thank you very much. Uh, that's, been all, that's been all. Um, I hope I, during this 30 minutes, managed to uh, inspire you to try those tools by, by yourself. Um, and thank you very much. We have two minutes for questions. And remember to rate. Thank you.